Hello, good afternoon. You and yours is 40 years old. Assuming you were around at the time, how well do you remember 1970? several, around 9% of the Conservatives, one of them being Enoch Powell's swing, but the other national swing is settling in, in this vicinity, 4.7% swing, but it still points to a Conservative majority, but to me at least... I predict that when I meet Joe Frazier, this will be like a good amateur fighting a real professional. This will be like a kid out of the Olympics meeting the fastest heavyweight champion that ever lived. This will be no contest. Footage of election night when Ted Heath became Prime Minister, the sounds of industrial unrest which became very familiar as the decade went on, and Muhammad Ali in characteristically self-confident form. Over the last four decades, there have been dramatic changes in some areas of life that this programme concentrates on. The way we produce and consume food, how our homes are heated and lit, how we travel, and attitudes to people with disabilities. But we start today with the telephone. When you and yours launched in 1970, it was all landlines and call boxes. Today, it's smartphones that practically run our lives. In the next hour, we'll look back, we'll focus on the present and ask what the future may bring in the world of telecommunications. First, though, a reminder of the part the telephone played in our lives 40 years ago. I'm finding my nephew. He's a lovely boy, but what we've got to say is just between us. All right? So you phone someone of your own. Bosie, it's me. Here. Your eavesdropping. Find someone of your own now when it's cheap. The number of people who have telephones is still fairly limited. There's something rather intrusive and insistent about a telephone call. I find it extremely difficult, extremely frustrating and very expensive. In five years' time, when enough of our exchanges have been modernised, we'll get the instant push-button phone. You plug your new phone into an old socket. When you move house, you can take it with you. In this latest exchange, all the controlling and decision-making machinery is electronic. We're going to modernise this system of ours. And with System X, that will bring a quality of service that's unmatched by any network anywhere else in the world today. Digital transmission involves converting that analog signal into a series of pulses, a digital code, zeros and ones. No boosters are necessary. It's immune to attack from noise and interference because the receiving equipment only recognizes the digital code. Hello? So in 1970, only a small percentage of us had a telephone at home, and if we were out and about and needed to make a call, we had to use a phone box. How things have changed. A recent survey said that we'd rather lose our wallet than our mobile phone, the theory being that there'd be less disruption to our lives caused by cancelling cards and saying goodbye to a bit of cash than there would be if all the phone numbers we rely upon, not to mention confidential information like our bank accounts, went AWOL. Well, Neil Johannesson is a consultant in communications heritage, and Dan Simmons is a reporter on Click. That's the BBC News Channel's technology programme, and both are going to be with me throughout the programme today. Neil, paint us a picture of the telephone of 1970. The phone of the 1970 really is a follow through from striving to solve some of the post war problems. The post office, the GPO, as it was until the end of the 1960s, was a civil service department. Um, although it sounds very familiar, was always struggling to get its money from the government for investment. And there were other things to invest in, so there was an awful lot of shortages. There was an awful lot of making do with old technologies, partly because every time they tried a new technology, there was, a, if you like, another one that was almost going to come along and let's wait a little bit longer for that. So they, they stuck with things which were really pre-war, tried to get as many of as they could in. Lots of people wanted telephones... Lots of people couldn't have them, so more people had shared service. Uh, anybody who remembers shared service, you had one pair of wires between you and perhaps your next-door neighbour. You could both use the phone, but not at the same time. Mm. You got a discount, but it wasn't exactly uh, ideal. 
The telephone was rented from the post office. Um, you couldn't buy your own telephone, although it is true to say that by the no 1970s, people were beginning to buy their own telephone, and they were beginning to connect them up to the post office's network, and that was, to a certain extent, driving change in another, in another sort of, if you like, popular direction. Um, but the services were nothing like you would expect nowadays. Um, you could just about dial uh, New York from London. You couldn't dial America from Britain. You could dial New York from London. Uh, Birmingham and Manchester came along a couple of years later. You could dial quite a bit of Europe, but only from some parts of Britain. You couldn't even dial all of Britain. Tried Britain. It was still very much sorting itself out after the war. You hinted there at consumer demand, and as people began to realise what this technology could offer, how much were they demanding change, and presumably quite quickly? Yeah, people, people saw what was happening elsewhere. People were beginning to experience it, as, as one of your other programmes is going to do. People were travelling more. So people were going, say, to New York. They were experiencing what the Bell America companies were able to offer. They weren't necessarily experiencing what the Deep South companies were offering, but they were seeing things and saying, I want one of those. I want an answering machine that will take a message, not just say, he's not in, can you call back later? Uh, so they were all coming to if you like, press for faster change than the post office thus far had been able to, uh, able to deliver. And was the technology there to help that change happen? The, the, in a sense, the concept technologies were there, but the actual hardware was still, if you like, in the labs. Um, uh, optical fibre was available, but it certainly couldn't do anything like the distances that, that were, were used nowadays. Um, digital switching had been trialled, but it wasn't really the sort of thing that could be scaled up. And microelectronics were beginning to start to become a part of, of if you like, hardware of, of all sorts. And that was what was needed to, say, put keypads in telephones. So, in a sense, the, the, the juvenile technology was there, but the actual deliverable technology was just probably, say, five or ten years away then. Well, despite that consumer demand that we've just talked about, uh, a lot of us then were quite wary of this new method of communication. Here's an example of that scepticism from an edition of Any Questions broadcast in early 1972. David Jacobs was in the chair, and the first voice you'll hear is that of Baroness Wooten, as panellists examined the merits of making a telephone call as opposed to writing a letter. Well, I think one of the first things one has to think of is that a letter can be delivered to any address, whoever you are, and whatever your means, and that the number of people who have telephones is still fairly limited. Russell Braden. I don't find telephoning easy at all. I dial a number and nothing happens. <laughs> I dial it again and nothing happens. I dial it a third time and I get the wrong number. I find it extremely difficult, extremely frustrating and very expensive to telephone, so I'd prefer to write and to be written to. <laughs> Furthermore, I don't particularly enjoy telephone calls, either getting them or making them, but I do enjoy letters and I do like to read my letters in the bath and I don't want to have my bath at three o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> so please, will that, whatever that counsel is, keep cracking and make sure that I get my letters at eight in the morning. <laughs> Anthony Lewis. My bath doesn't come into it one way or the other. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I do much prefer letters as a generality because they preserve one's privacy. There's something rather intrusive and insistent about a telephone call. And I know, uh, I remember that an American who had a great affection for this country, uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter, he came and spent a year at Oxford in the 1930s, uh, wrote afterwards that the habit of letter writing, which was preserved in this country much more than in the United States, was one of the most civilized things, and I still feel that. Lord David Cecil. Well, I feel rather divided about this. Uh, I really think everything that the rest of the team have said is true. On the other hand, I can't bear writing letters, and I'm really nervous when I get them. <laughs> but, I mean, I used to get quite that nervous when I was young and had friends, and it was all very humorous and romantic. But now I either get letters uh, which are bills, or people saying I've not paid my taxes, or would I come and uh, make a speech to them in the Outer Hebrides, and they'll give me tea. <laughs> Uh, and I rather hate getting letters and so the idea of not having the post is rather agreeable I loved the postal strike I thought it was marvellous 
fantastic excerpt from Any Questions back in early 1972. Dan Simmons, if you'd been on that panel, would you be in, would you have been pro letters or pro telephone calls? I've got to say, I think I might just sit on the fence on that one. I was thinking, <laughs> listening, listening back to that, I was thinking um, this explosion that we saw later on in phones, in mobile phones with texting. I think was partly so that you didn't intrude on people with a phone call. A phone call is very insistent. When the phone rings, you have to pick it up. It's it's a do or die moment. You have to drop everything. And I think we kind of quite enjoy getting little texts or or little pictures that are sent to us that we can open up in our own time and enjoy and respond to thoughtfully. So on that side of of, of the argument, um, I think maybe text is replaced the letter. Well, I'll talk more about the etiquette of, of phone use um, a little bit later on in the programme, but I know you've been talking to your viewers, or they've been talking to you, mm. about what you call wow moments in the last 40 years of telecommunications. What are they telling you? Well, after being invited on the programme today, we asked our Twitter followers to um, tweet us some of their wow facts of the last 40 years, and here's a few. Chris Taylor writes, um, my first phone, the Nokia 5110, exchangeable covers, wow. Uh, John Ferguson says, getting a phone at home was amazing in 1980. It saved all the family having to traipse down the bottom of the road and use the phone box. Uh, Phil Cornwall writes, uh, first cordless with a retractable aerial was amazing. I was able to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the garden. I can't possibly talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and dialing up the BBC WAP site uh, was another one that, uh, that came up. Of course, WAP preceded the full website, so it's a, sort of a restricted web version for mobile phones. And that was done on his Motorola a Motorola, a, a, a big player in the mobile phone space, especially early on. And then um, Gareth Ellis writes his uh, Nokia 3210 did it with the immersion of um, or, or the, the, uh, the, the arrival of something called T9, which many people may not know, but it's that little program that works in the background when you're texting away that tries to predict what you're going to write, predictive text, with varying amounts of success. I yes, think, and occasionally like slightly embarrassing mistakes yes as i recall um neil anderson going back to the the cordless phone my recollection of the arrival of the cordless phone was that yes it probably was a wow moment but um it didn't always work very well when you moved more than about six feet away from the machine uh, yes quite the the first cordless telephones ct1 types uh, the post office introduced one called the hawk which was a lovely name that they were bandying around that had its moments it didn't like being used near fluorescent lighting um, it didn't work too far away from the from the device, but it didn't have a great deal of other radio devices in the home interfering with it, which is a problem that Wi-Fi can have. So, in a sense, it was actually rather good, but it was very limited. Um, you then follow that with CT2 and CT3, you know, the, the, the sort of decked and also the, the, the rabbit type of uh, cordless phone, which had the advantage of being able to use outside and, mm. and sort of go down the street and slightly bizarrely stand in in line of sight from a telephone box and use the rabbit phone outside the box, which always struck me as a, a little bit odd. But, um, yeah, cordless phones had their moments. And, Dan, of course, the first mobile phones were enormous. Mm, they were absolutely huge. We've all seen those pictures, haven't we, in the city of, uh, of men dressed in suits with suitcases, or rather uh, briefcases, and uh, on their bricks. And those were quite advanced. Those weren't the first ones. So the first uh, portable phones were those in cars, and, you, and they had batteries in the boot to charge them up, and you were very lucky um, to get more than about 20 minutes out of them, um, I recall. And you were very lucky to get a signal absolutely. as well. Absolutely, mm, yeah. And some people used to sell the car because it had a mobile phone in it, because they were very difficult to get, because there were so few channels, there were so few terminals to be used on it. But now it is that must-have item, almost, isn't it? I mentioned that, that idea that we would rather lose our wallet, our purses, than our mobile phones. We certainly, yeah, certainly would. If you gave me the choice, absolutely. I can, I can replace perhaps uh, the, the, the small amount of cash that I'm holding, get my cards replaced, but everything that's on my phone is rather more difficult. And it's such a personal assistant nowadays. Um, my calendar is on my mobile phone. Uh, all of my contacts are on my mobile phone. My email is on my mobile phone. My email history is on my mobile phone. If somebody sent me directions, I can find out where I am because I have my mobile phone. I can find out how to get to where I need to be because I've got my mobile phone it does so many things now it is so integrated into what we do that the mobile phone is for my money the technology 
the, the main piece of technology within our lives today, the most crucial piece. More to come from Neil and Dan throughout the programme. As Neil mentioned, the 1970s when was a decade of big changes in our relationship with the telephone. In fact, such was the demand for phones that the post office struggled to keep up with it. But was Britain ahead of the game? In America, the system was run rather differently, and reporter Judith Han examined that difference for a programme called The Risk Business back in July 1978. Hear those tones? That's the information travelling down the line, telling the exchange where to route my call. There's enough information in those simple tones to trigger the common control unit of the exchange. Now, if I'm dialing long distance, those first three digits are enough to tell them where to look. The control unit instantly recognises the code for the place I'm trying to reach. It now starts to hunt for the cheapest route through the trunk microwave network. Because America has four different time zones, some exchanges will be lying idle. At the same time, others are fully occupied. So if I'm calling from, say, New York to Seattle, it may try via Chicago or perhaps St. Louis or even Memphis. By the time I've finished dialing, they'll have found the route. Yes, there it is. With none of those, all the lines to London are engaged. Please try later. It's also possible to talk directly to computers using multitone. For example, if you want to check the credit rating of a customer, you just have to put through your own card, then put through his credit card. Then it's a question of keying in the amount he wants to spend and wait for the computer to give you a message. Approval granted for sale totaling $890.00. Although only 20% of America has access to it today, everybody wants multitone. So Bell Telephones is working hard to extend the system and at the same time increase its sales. In America, the company which runs the network is also responsible for manufacturing handsets and selling them to the public. But 70% of Americans are already on the phone. So Bell can only sell more telephones by turning them into two phone families. Hey baby, I'm your telephone and you just show me where you want it and I'll put it where I can. I can put it in the bedroom, I can put it in the hall, I can put it in the bathroom, I can hang it on the wall. In this shop, phones are the only goods on sale. You try them out and if you're a first time buyer, there's no waiting in a post office queue. The sales staff simply call up the telephone company to confirm the sale and get you a number. You choose the style you want, and when you take it home, you plug your new phone into an old socket. When you move house, you can take it with you. You just take out the plug, and in your new house, there'll be an existing socket. Now, this happens to suit the telephone company, because the government doesn't allow them to charge the full cost of installing a telephone. They actually lose $25 on every house call. But when you do need service, the phone men get there quickly. Because if you can't use your phone, they're not making money. Wednesday at three, I called the phone company singing, Hey baby, put a phone in for me. Thursday at four, he came and knocking at my door singing, Hey baby... There's a massive investment in equipment running from exchange to user. Every new house has a phone line wired in, waiting to be used. But there's one sector where the phones always get used. It gives the Bell system over half its revenue, and it's there that new services get their first trial, the business community. At work, what drives you mad? Is it the frustration of trying to get through to somebody like Mr Wiggins in marketing, whose phone always seems to be engaged? Yes, no surprise, there we go again. Well, here, there's a way of getting over that. All you have to do is dial star 7, and the number again, put down your phone, and as soon as Wiggins is off the line, my phone will ring. Now, if I'm free to take it, I just pick up the phone, and I'm there. Wiggins speaking. Hello, Mr. Wiggins. Can I come and see you now? Sure, Judith. Come right on in. Good. Or is your main worry that if you have to leave the office, a call you've been waiting for for a very long time might be missed? Well, there's an answer for that one. Dial star four, and that extension again. Put down the phone. And now my call will be automatically rerouted to Mr. Wiggins' office. Mr. Wiggins, how nice to see you. Hello, how are you? It rings once to check I haven't come back in the meantime, and then it's switched to the other number. Wiggins speaking. Yes, she is. Just a moment. 
Oh, my call is obviously being transferred to this extension. Thank you. Then if you want to share that call with other colleagues, you can have a telephone conference. I can bring as many as six other people Hello, in on Joe, my conference, and they don't have to be in the same building or even the same part of America. The conference can combine internal and external lines. The exchange that makes those facilities, and dozens more, possible, is no bigger than a large filing cabinet. Each of these circuit boards controls four extensions, so it's a total of 400 altogether. If you need extra extensions, it's just a question of plugging in a new board. So the telephone engineer of tomorrow will be more at home with computer logic than with his screwdriver and soldering iron. That was Judith Hand back in 1978, uh, pestering Mr Wiggins, quite above from anything else. Um, Neil, the contrast between America and Britain at that point was very clear in that report. As other countries progressed, were we keeping up or not? We were keeping up in some parts of the country and in comparison with other parts of the world, but not all. Some countries with small, undeveloped network could leapfrog us by just putting in a couple of brand new exchanges. We had 6,000 exchanges to change. Some parts of the cities, Britain, um, London, for example, has still got, and certainly then had one of the best world-connected networks, which compared very favourably with some parts of America. So it depends which bit you choose to compare as to whether or not Britain was doing well or not. What we weren't doing was investing enough, and that was a continuing political theme. Mm. Well, the omnipresence of the mobile uh, means that payphones are slowly disappearing from our streets. BT is getting rid of the ones that aren't used much and those that don't make a profit. 39,000 have been lost in the last eight years, and only 12,500 iconic red phone boxes are left. But hundreds of communities around the country are giving those distinctive call boxes a new lease of life. They may no longer house a phone, but they've become local shops, places to get information, and even somewhere you can get hold of emergency medical treatment. The latest people to adopt their call box are the villages of Martin Cum Grafton in North Yorkshire. BBC reporter Neil Smallburn went along to the grand unveiling last week of the new library, which is housed inside the iconic red phone box, much to the delight of some of the residents. I think it's a great idea. I think it would be a shame if it was left empty. I think that would be a real shame. I think why not use it for something interesting, something exciting, something a bit different. The children are very keen. They've got the books in already and uh, just beginning to swap. So you're hoping to use it sh shortly? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I'll keep an eye out for your title ready for my holidays. Well, in nearby Settle, villagers have breathed new life into their call box by turning it into an art gallery, which they say is probably the smallest gallery in the world. And it's about to welcome a big star. Queen guitarist Brian May is collaborating with the Gallery on the Green to display a collection of Victorian stereoscopic images. Well, earlier I gave him a call to find out what stereoscopic images are and why he chose this particular venue. Well, anyone who's been to see Avatar has a clue <laughs> as to what stereoscopic images are. I mean, we're, we're in a bit of a stereoscopic boom at the moment, I'm quite happy to say. And most of the movies you see these days seem to be available in 3D. But this goes right back to the 1850s, which is the, the dawn of photography, more or less, to the common man. I mean, the, the concept was invented uh, a few years earlier, but really photography starts in the 1850s, and stereoscopy was already a known quantity and was very, very popular for a while. It was that hugely, they were like pop record stereo cards in the 1850s. So these images are from that time, from the very first boom in stereoscopic photography. And they focus specifically, don't they, on one man, T.R. Williams. Tell us a bit about him. Yes, T.R. Williams was really a master of the art very, very early on, a supreme technician, scientist, but also a wonderful artist. And in this particular series, he decided to immortalise the village which he grew up in, a little village uh, in Berkshire called Hinton Waldrist, which happily is still there. Um, and happily, I was the person to discover it. <laughs> so we went there and, and, and were able to find a lot of the features which you can see in these stereoscopic pictures from 150 years ago. It's a beautiful village. And he was immortalising not just a village, but a whole way of life and a way of thinking. It's a very profound little documentary really that he's made about 60 stereo cards each with a verse on the back with his thoughts on well village life and life in general and spirituality and nature all the things which we still <laughs> juggle in our heads these days and there was a serious danger was there that these images would have been lost for good 
Yes, well, when I first discovered them, I, I discovered them in ones and twos, and they were very, very rare. I've been collecting stereo cards for about 40 years now, and it's only very occasionally you come across one of these beautiful cards called Scenes in Our Village. And I was intrigued. I, I wondered what they were, and nobody could tell me. There was no collection of them in existence. And so I sort of set out on a kind of pilgrimage, I suppose, to find them all. And eventually I did find them all. So for the first time, they are in a, a book altogether. And they're actually viewable the way they were meant to be. You mentioned the book. There is going to be this chance for people in, in Settle in North Yorkshire to see these images yes. in, the, in the gallery on the green, which is this extraordinary, I think it, it claims to be the smallest gallery in the country because it is just a BT phone box. There's, there's it something... is indeed. It's an intriguing concept, isn't it? <laughs> and of course it fits us really well because it's a very intimate experience. Uh, stereo normally I mean it's not true of movies but the Victorian stereoscopic experience was you just sit there with your little viewer and it's like a little peep show a very one to one kind of thing so that's exactly what you'll get in the phone box you'll be in there on your own just with the images and the viewer and hopefully a little bit of a commentary which we're trying to put together we're trying to conquer the technical problems of doing that <laughs> especially in a phone box which has no power but that's the idea you'll be alone with your 3D images and there's going to be room for all the images in there is there? around no. the edge of the box? no, you, there, you'll have no, to leave some no. out presumably we'll just do a selection otherwise people would have to be in there all day and that's probably not very uh, yeah. <laughs> practical <laughs> it ties in rather nicely with what we're also talking about on the programme as we go back 40 years of the telephone I mean what's intriguing about this is that I suspect it's quite a long time since you last went into a phone box and used it for the purpose that it was originally <laughs> intended for I know, I often talk about this it's amazing, you can't imagine a world without mobile phones now can you? it's very strange, I remember fighting my way out in three feet of snow one New Year's Day to try and tell someone I couldn't come down and see them and it was about half a mile to the phone box and then and then you managed to sort of <laughs> wrench the door open and there you had your button A and your button B and you put your four pennies in and you made that call but there was no other way we didn't have phones in the house in those days it was just the phone box and sometimes you had to wait outside and there would be a queue which would be very annoying <laughs> uh, so life has really changed doesn't it and even when the first mobile phones came along they weren't exactly user friendly were they that's right I remember I had a brick the big grey brick <laughs> but that was a revolution and now w could you imagine going anywhere without it no it's hell if you forget your mobile phone and you're trying to meet someone you're suddenly feeling very helpless, aren't you? Because you can't get in contact. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. I don't know if the world is better for it, but it's certainly different. Brian May of Queen. Well, coming up in the next half hour of this special programme, marking our 40th anniversary, we examine how the improvements in telecommunications have enhanced the world of business. We ask what the consumer has gained from the arrival of the call centre. And in the future, what more can possibly be added to the modern-day mobile? But let's talk etiquette for a few moments because there comes a time in any technological revolution when some basic guidelines need to be laid down. It happened when email exploded on the scene and now the same seems to be happening regarding how we use our phones. Communications heritage consultant Neil Johannesson and technology reporter Dan Simmons are still with me. Neil, phone etiquette isn't new, is it? What were the ethical do's and don'ts back in 1970? Well, the, in a sense, they they came from the very beginning of the telephone, and one of the assumptions had to be always assume that you're intruding on the person you're phoning. Um, never take their willingness to talk to you for granted. Um, would that be the case today? I'm not sure. Um, so you might choose your time very carefully. You would start the conversation by saying, are you OK to talk at the moment? Should I call? Is there a better time to call? Um, the... That would limit the amount of time that you might want to be on the telephone because you wouldn't want to take too much time. You'd avoid meal times. Um, you might also arrange a specific time to talk to individuals in the family. So, for example, it might be a very short call to the telephone, which is at the bottom of the stairs in the hall, um, to the teenager and saying, well, if I call you back at the telephone box later, we can have a longer talk. Um, local calls were untimed at uh, certain points mm. in the history. So it, it was very much a matter of mutual cooperation and mutual generosity. Whereas, is it fair to say, Dan, that nearly all that politeness has now gone? Pretty much, isn't it, really? <laughs> I mean, we pick out our mobile phones. We've got our heads in our mobile phones every minute, every day. You look around the bus or the or the uh, train and everyone's sort of either sort of in a newspaper or in 
in their mobile phone emailing or texting away or receiving calls i mean i've got a few examples here of 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 um, where we might like to draw a few boundaries, if we don't mind. Uh, Rod Stewart kicked it all off, didn't he, last year, um, by saying that he puts a bowl out at dinner times and says, right, everybody, pop your mobile phones in the bowl. There'll be no using those while we have dinner uh, to sort of encourage this, uh, this the conversation around the dinner table. Um, on the train, ringtones. Oh, how annoying are ringtones? Very, I mean, they come in all sorts, uh, shapes and sizes. There used to be the awful bleepy versions of the latest tracks in the in the charts. Now they're the real thing, and um, and they can be incredibly embarrassing for the person receiving the call, which is always a bit of a laugh. Um, on the street, nutters, weren't they? Five years ago, when they started using Bluetooth headsets, do you remember? You'd see yes, somebody walking towards you, and they'd be going, "Oh, oh, 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 oh yes, I'm doing you well." You'd be thinking. Oh, I'd better, <laughs> better give him a little bit of a wide berth. <laughs> and uh, as it's sort of underneath the long hair, he's screaming away on his Bluetooth headset. Driving, of course. We all used our mobile phones when we went driving, didn't we? We just picked it up and uh, the phone would ring and you'd... It, again, it's that the phone rings, mm. I have to pick it up, regardless mm. of what I'm doing, until 2003, when we got rid of all of that. And then I was reading something about planes. Now, planes is one of those few places now which is a respite from the mobile phone can't use your phone on a plane got to turn it off might ruin the uh, might ruin the engines or mm. whatnot it they mean, go sorry go on i was just going to say that that the the, the 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 airlines are planning to introduce wi-fi next year now a survey out about a month ago said that most passengers who use airplanes do not want to be able to receive or make calls on the aircraft the problem is a lot of businessmen want to be able to use Wi-Fi to use the data connection. And, of course, nowadays we can make a call over a data connection. So how are you going to stop people doing that? I think I might be with the majority on that one. Um, if our tendency to be inconsiderate when using our mobiles is a modern-day source of irritation, here is another one. The automated switchboard. Yes, it's seen as a must for any business that wants to be able to provide a 24-hour-a-day service to customers... But be honest, when was the last time you enjoyed being put on hold? Here are the thoughts of The Now Show's Steve Punt. Welcome to this short feature on telephone services. Please be aware that this call is being recorded for broadcasting purposes. You will now be given a series of options. For tone-operated services, press 1. For voice-operated services, press 2. For pre-recorded messages at all hours offering you consolidated loans, press hand to forehead and shout, NOT AGAIN! For the thing you actually wanted to talk about, but which isn't quite covered by any of the above options, hang on to the end and listen to the message again before pressing 3. To listen to the message again before pressing 3, press 4. <coughs> Welcome to this short feature on telephone services. You will now be offered the same series of options you were offered before, but didn't quite understand which one you actually needed. For tone-operated services, press 1. For voice-operated services, say yes and feel a bit silly. To speak to one of our operators, press 3. All our operators are busy at the moment because almost everybody presses 3. You are now being held in a queue. You are number 496 in the queue. To return to the main menu, key hash. Welcome to this short feature on telephone services. You will now hear the options again and not listen properly because you're so irritated at not getting through to an operator. This means you will miss your preferred option you have pressed the wrong option. Welcome to our automated payment system. Please enter the extremely long number on the front of your credit card. If you make a mistake, press the star key and say goodbye to the next half an hour. Your payment has been accepted. You will now be given a transaction reference number, which you will need to quote in the event of any problem. Your transaction number is 84397492674C913B4287311469 247D Bravo Lima Tanga Foxtrot 362436BA 747XJS H20093321 06 X. If you would like to hear that reference number again, which you obviously would since it was read very fast and was so long you ran out of paper, press hash. You have selected Shrek 4 in screen 7. Your tickets will be held for 30 minutes.
Thank you for calling British Gas. <laughs> Steve Punt. Now, when you, uh, when you do finally get through to a real person, uh, it may well be to someone who's based at a call or contact centre, as they now like to be called. It could well be based offshore, and if it's in the UK, it may well not be owned by the company you have actually called. Many businesses now outsource them. They originated as a money-saving measure by US companies several decades ago, but they only really started to take off in the UK in the late 1970s. These days, they employ over a million people and they account for 3.5% of the working population. Steve Morell is the MD of Contact Babel, who are contact centre industry analysts. Steve, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Who were the first companies to use call centres? There's a bit of debate about that, because you could say that British Telecom, with their operator services, had it since basically the year dot, but I think it's generally agreed that some of the larger catalogue and mail order firms in the UK were the first ones to really get to grips with kind of telephone-based service. And by doing it, they were saving themselves significant sums of money, presumably. Yeah, that's right, they were. But it's more the case that for a mail order company that they now have a nationwide presence rather than, you know, for example, a shop which only has a local presence. Mail order is something that's always been very big in this country and a lot of that is down to actually the the bad weather and the historically short opening hours for shops. And that was the argument uh, as regards the consumer, was it, that they would gain as well because in theory this would be more convenient? Yes, that's right. And in fact, we can see that with deregulation in the in the 80s, this really helped on the industry because they got cheap calls so people weren't too scared to pick up the phone in case they ran up a huge bill. And there was also new products came along like Freephone, for example, which, you know, really pushed people to actually call companies. But you know what I'm going to say now. Consumers don't like them. Well, consumers don't like them, but do consumers, you know, back in the good old days, if you wanted to buy car insurance, for example, you'd have to take an afternoon off, drive to the high street or get the bus to the high street, queue up, um, you know, while people in front of you were seen in the insurance broker, and even then you wouldn't get, you know, the, the many options that you actually get now simply by picking up a phone. So, yes, while people don't like certain elements of call centres or contact centres, for example, queuing, the alternatives are, you know, people seem to forget the alternatives were, were far more inconvenient Well, queuing is interesting because there is a difference, is there not, between the figures I think you have to hand uh, and the reality. Um, We think we queue for a long time. You would argue that the figures would suggest otherwise. Is that right? That's right. We did a large-scale survey of the public a few years ago, and they said that, on average, they believed that they queued to talk to a contact centre for about 11 and a half minutes, which obviously seems like a very long time, and perhaps many people are nodding and thinking, yes, that's about the same as me. But we've tracked the industry over a number of years, interviews with thousands and thousands of contact centres, and seen their actual data. In fact, the reality is the average wait is only 25 seconds. Um, So that's 23 times less than we believe. So time spent waiting in a call centre queue is like time spent in a dentist's chair. Come on, Steve, I've heard green sleeves for longer than 25 seconds. <laughs> Absolutely, but you probably don't remember the times when you were picked up on straight away. What about the decision by some companies to initially have their contact centres offshore and now think twice about it? Just talk us through that decision-making process. Yeah, well, offshoring um, became big news in 2002 and 2003. It actually became quite a you know political hot potato then. The big driver for that was the fact that in India, for example, which is only one of the many places that actually carry out offshore customer service, people there were only being paid one-eighth of the salary than they were in the UK. So businesses looked at this, they thought, this is a really easy way to improve my bottom line, let's go ahead and do it. Now, all well and good in theory as well as for the business in any case, but the customer, more than three quarters of the population, and this was back in 2005, said that they had worse service from an offshore contact centre than they did from a UK contact centre. And many of them actually defected, in fact more defected, um, losing, uh, losing more than they actually gained by going out there in the first place. What does the future hold in this area specifically, do you think? Well, there's still a lot of offshore customer contact. Um... I will say that those it's a strategic decision for many businesses. Those that have been out there have actually moved more agents out there, and those that said no at the beginning have, to a greater or lesser extent, stuck with that and made it kind of one of the, the promises to the customer that they'll have UK-only call centres. I can see a role for it, but I actually think there's a lot more in terms of, say, back-office work and non-customer-facing work that's better for offshore, because elements such as things like um, the accent and the culture simply doesn't apply in those cases. Steve Morell, thank you very much for coming on the programme.
So we've talked about two of the biggest changes in the business world as a result of developments in telecommunications, the automated switchboard and the opening of call or contact centres. But businesses now face newer demands. People are getting used to not only making and receiving calls wherever they are, but they want to be able to get online too. We increasingly expect Wi-Fi access and often we expect it for nothing. How does the business world respond? Well, technology reporter Dan Simmons, communications heritage consultant Neil Johannesson are still here with me. It's worth, Neil, just going back for a moment. This idea of always being contactable, the pager fitted into this area at one point, didn't it? In our in, lives? Indeed it did, yes. The, the pager offered the opportunity for your office to keep you in touch. You couldn't call back. Um, it was a one-way device. Um, the best you would get, although they did introduce uh, message pages that could have a, a few sort of limited uh, characters, um, would be that you would be told you're needed. So you phoned a number that w was your standard number and your office would then give you the message or tell you to hightail it off to another place because the meeting's been moved or whatever. So it was very, very restricted, but it did actually fulfil a, a, a need to... Uh, if you like, keep the, keep the workforce actually much more in touch with what's going on. Dan, let's bring it up to the present day in the world of work. How have the new generation of smartphones changed the way we as individuals actually work? Well, um, working from home has become extremely um, popular uh, over the last sort of 10, 15 years. But now we've moved on to working on the move. So we don't have to even be at home to be uh, adapting that uh, Microsoft Office document or, or to be uh, writing that, that key email. Um, it, it does strike, it's not all one way. It's not all um, uh, roses in this, in this garden. I would say that roaming, for example, is incredibly expensive. So if your job should take you abroad, um, you, you, you could get a huge shock when you get back to the to, to the UK. Um, also, Wi-Fi hotspots. People constantly say to me, well, you know, you're complaining about the roaming, what not. why don't you just use a Wi-Fi hotspot? Go to a hotel and, well, have a guess at how much they'd like mm. to charge you just for hopping on and checking your emails. Often it's it's ten ten pounds, fifteen pounds, something like that. Well, I mentioned some being free, but a lot aren't, are they? That's true. A, a huge amount aren't, and uh, and so this this connected world, this 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 convenience, I think, still has some way to go. But what about the world of business responding to the fact that we are almost 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 always accessible and feel that we can access things all the time as well? How have they adapted to that? Well, you're always on. You're always. Um, a, a approachable by the company that you're working for. So, whereas before you would go home, you'd leave your desk, the light would go off, you'd jump on the bus. Um, you're still contactable. I left the office today to come here about an hour ago, and uh, the first thing that happened five minutes later was one of my team called me to ask me several questions while I was on the bus on the way here. And that's just accepted, and that's part of business practice nowadays. New business opportunities have opened up here as well, haven't they? If you look at something like um, the iPhone, for example, clearly there are people out there making all the applications that people are loading onto their iPhone, and this is quite big business games as well, presumably. Mm, it's, it's absolutely huge. The largest area of gaming, which we must remember is a larger... Uh, has, has a bit greater turnover than the movie industry. The largest area of gaming is social gaming is, is 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 casual gaming and the largest platform for casual gaming by far is the mobile phone much more than any handheld set it's a bit like cameras i suppose nokia is the biggest world's biggest camera maker um and and so the, the opportunity to be productive using not just the phone in the standard ways but specific apps um that you can download to the phone little programs that run and allow you to do different things um has has made us more productive in, at times when we when we might otherwise have not been and they can be programmed by your employer as well so they can be specific for your job but I mean, we can waste time industry. as well of course, we, we? of course we can i mean you can, that's uh, that's probably what facebook and twitter was invented for <laughs> so we'd um, we'd rather lose our money in credit cards than our mobile phone we established earlier on but um here's the story of a man who wouldn't be alive if he'd been without his. Mark Corbett was on board a sinking ship 140 miles off the coast of Puerto Rico, a ship ironically called the Titanic. Uh, using a satellite phone, he managed to call one of the only telephone numbers he knew by heart, his best mate, Alex's mobile. It was then up to Alex to coordinate the unlikely rescue mission from a DIY store in Aberystwyth. Mark told us the extraordinary story of how he was saved. Well, 140 miles offshore, off Puerto Rico, with an engine room full of water, with a stern 
in the water with the wind behind us pushing water or more water onto the deck slowly sinking us in a, in a situation where we were quite far away and communications were low so we had to think quite fast about what our plan was to get ourselves off the boat and get the boat saved at the same time whilst on board originally we tried to uh, contact the US Coast Guard through the, um, the VHF equipment we've got on board but having no luck there we managed to uh, bring out a satellite phone that the owner had kept just in case of emergencies and give Alex a call from there he was in B&Q with his mum at the time he got a receipt and took all the details down contacted Falmouth Coast Guard and went from there I remember reading in the newspaper that, that he thought it was a joke because it was the day before April Fool's Day and he was quite shocked but he soon kind of went into action we launched a life raft and we had our life jackets on floating next to the side of the boat we were passed overhead by several aircraft to make sure we were okay the crew were pretty dehydrated we couldn't eat and couldn't drink because contamination problems with the uh, various different other tanks from the boat getting in the way of the water so we were pretty dehydrated and hungry and it was still quite warm um, despite our location offshore um, so a lot of it was just trying to keep the morale up between the crew and come up with tasks just to make the life easier for the US Coast Guard when they came on board start off with logistics coming to play more than anything you start thinking about what you can do how you can save the boat and everyone on board and you also think that you don't want to raise up too much of a fuss but after a while um, it's mainly after the situation when we got to land i realized with the kind of danger that i was in mark corbett and why he's very grateful to best mate alex for answering his distress call on his mobile joining me now is jeff matthews a search and rescue operations officer for her majesty's coast guard uh, jeff there's a lesson there isn't there have your mobile with you if you possibly can well, it's one of a number of um, devices that we can use to uh, to summon assistance. Um, we've got to remember that uh, that each type of equipment that we're using has its limitations, and uh, mobiles are just like that. Um, they're very good, generally speaking, on the land or on the coast, um, but as soon as you get them out to sea, uh, they become more limited in, in their usefulness. And that, perhaps, is another important element to this. We perhaps... We'll take it with us now, assuming it will always get, a, get us out of a hole, and actually quite often it won't. Indeed, that's the case in, 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 in a lot of times. Once you move offshore, um, the, the range of them depends entirely on the height of the, uh, the, the handset and, and the receiving mast ashore. And that can be sometimes uh, very limiting, but it also creates other effects for when we start actually plotting where to search for a handset. Um, bearing in mind that the range can be up to uh, 17 nautical miles, that's about 32 kilometres off or away from the, uh, the mast. In an arc of 120 degrees, that gives us a search area of around about 320 square miles, about twice the size of the Isle of Wight. Mm. So the VHF radio on board is frankly a good deal more useful when you're in dire straits. It is up to a range of about 30 nautical miles. We'll, uh, we'll pretty much guarantee that range off the shore of the UK, and mo most modern nations now are up to that standard. Um, if you go further offshore, you need different equipment again, and Mark's case was a good one in point, carrying a, a satellite mobile, but there are many other devices on the market for the mariner that goes offshore um, to allow them to summon help. A word, finally, about the work that you're doing on a committee looking at using, I think, text messages to summon help. Um, tell us a bit more about that. The 999 Liaison Committee is, uh, consists of all the, uh, or many of the um, communication service providers, the mobile phone companies, British Telecom, and um, all the emergency services, and they look at all sorts of developing technologies and one area that's come into play recently is um, allowing profoundly deaf or disabled people who would otherwise not be able to um, to access emergency authorities is to allow them to send a text to 999 um, and take that through a voice translation service straight into the operations rooms, the um, watch rooms of the emergency services. It's a subscription service, so they've got to sign up for it. It doesn't mm. cost them anything, um, but as soon as they're signed up for it, they can make emergency text calls. Jeff Matthews, thank you very much for coming on the programme. A final word to both my guests. Dan Simmons, what will the future of the mobile phone be? What more can we possibly add to it? 
Well, I think that voice recognition can get a bit better. That's a bit rubbish at the moment, isn't it? And um, I think we might um, drop things for our friends. So we might drop little breadcrumbs as to where we've been so when they go to the same places that we've been to, little things pop up on their mobiles and they push to their mobiles, perhaps, rather than being pulled. I'm not sure I always want my friends to know where I've been. Well, perhaps not. (laughs) Uh, Don't drop any breadcrumbs. Uh, I think um, our mobile phones will be able to increasingly detect changes in our... Um, in our bodies and in, in our health through um, light spectrum and through monitoring things like um, heartbeat. I also think that we'll move a lot of our own information into the cloud, so we'll have our own personal internet to to uh, take a look around, as well as the mm. public internet that's up there. There are other things I'm not entirely sure is going to take off, things like projectors in mobile phones, I think will be too battery sapping. Um, but but um, I think that the biggest thing that will affect us quickly over the next few years will be the increasing cost of data. Mm. Neil, a final thought from you on that. In in 30 seconds, where are we going to go from here, do you think? I think we have to question the long-term survival of the fixed-line telephone. Um, There are a lot of people now, a lot of people who have never had a telephone from British Telecom, BT as they prefer to be called now. Um, There's quite a few people who have never had a landline at all. Quite a lot of those possibly never will. And the bias towards that may well shift quite a lot more than anybody would imagine. Okay, Neil, Dan, thank you both very much indeed for being a part of the programme. By way of bringing uh, this edition of You and Yours to a close, it's worth saying that over our 40 years we've always been keen to hear from you, uh, mostly over the phone, but not always. Here's how listeners were advised by Joan York to contact us back in February 1972. I gave our address uh, earlier in the programme, but do remember that if you want to give us a ring and dictate a letter to our dictating machine, and dictate it slowly, please, the number is 01, for those living outside London, 580-4468, extension 3030. And in that same year, 1972, we were also doing phone-ins. If you have strong feelings about children's upbringing, particularly about the use of discipline in the home, then please write to us at You and Yours, because next Tuesday we're running a special telephone programme in which some of those who've already written to us will be contacted to express their views live by telephone. That's all for today. We'll be back tomorrow at our usual Friday time of ten past twelve. Derek Cooper in May 1972. Thank you for listening today, and do stay in touch via email or even by telephone.